Hi, and welcome to the Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast presented by Wolf Precision Incorporated, where we learn about and share long range shooting and custom rifle building. I am your host, Jamie Dotson, and welcome to the show. Hello, and thank you for joining us again. I am your host, Jamie Dotson from Wolf Precision Incorporated, and welcome to episode five. In this episode, we're going to be talking about triggers and stocks, all the things that you should take into consideration when trying to put your custom rifle together, preparing for a match, a hunt, competition, or coming to the shooting school. So there's several things we want to pass along here. A lot of it we feel is pretty important uh, to help you take your best shot in the field. So without further ado, let's get started. So we're going to be talking about rifle stocks, stock selection, some things to keep in mind, as well as triggers. So when you get into the rifle stock, there's a couple of things to take into consideration when you're going with a factory gun or building a custom rifle and some modifications that you can actually make to help take your best shot in the field. So let's start with the most common. Let's get into the factory stocks. When you buy a rifle that you intend to shoot, either precision shooting, bench rest, long range, whatever, the rifle stock is really where the rubber meets the road. And it just absolutely astounds me and astonishes me when you get into a factory gun that costs a total of $800, dollars And all of the machining and engineering, research and development – I honestly don't know how they can make a rifle for that price. They have to make the barrel. They have to make the action, the trigger, so much involved in it. <clears throat> but the one area that I find that is an area that they sort of shortchange a little bit, in, in some cases and in most cases, is the rifle stock. So when you take a factory rifle... Right out of the gate, one of the biggest mistakes that, that you'll run into or one of the biggest issues you'll run into as a shooter is the fact that most of your factory stocks have an, a length of pull of 13 and a half inches. Well, that probably works for, you know, 30, maybe 35% of the shooters. So you take someone who's uh, on a shorter statue of, let's just say, you know, 5 feet 2, 5 feet 4 well, that person trying to shoot that long of length of pull is going to set sideways to the stock. If you can almost picture like what a child would look like shooting an adult rifle, the length of pull is too long. If you take someone that's much taller, someone who's much bigger, um, six foot two, six foot four, well, you give them that same rifle. Now they look like an adult shooting a child's rifle. And so what often happens is they end up really messing up their fundamentals simply because they have to compensate what should be their natural point of aim to make up for the stock not fitting them correctly. So right out of the gate, a lot of the issues that come into play, besides the quality of the stock, is really it's just the wrong length of pull. There's there's the shotgun measurement that will measure your length of pull going from, of course, the, the elbow or the inner portion of your arm to the tips of your fingers. I am not a shotgun expert. I do know that that doesn't really hold true to rifles. So a 13 and a half length of pull probably works well for someone around five foot nine. And maybe for every inch taller or an inch shorter, you should take a quarter of an inch or add a quarter of an inch to that length of pull. And that's usually a pretty good guideline. I heard someone describe it that way. And after teaching the shooting school for more than a decade, I find that to be pretty accurate. <clears throat> now it doesn't it's not always a hard and fast rule because you can have someone that's five foot ten. And really, um, out of the norm, shoot a 14 and three quarter inch length of pull. A good friend of mine, uh, Richard uh, Jones, shot lots of matches with him. I mean, he shoots over a 14 and a half inch length of pull. He's only several inches taller than me. And when I go to shoot his rifle, it just feels really long. I mean, uh, to, for me to shoot that rifle properly, I'd have to take at least an inch out of their spacer. So uh, it's, it's a good guideline. But it's not carved in stone that it's a one size fits all that here's the rule and this will work perfect for you. So you get into a factory stock right away, um, the length of pull is an issue. The other part that gets involved in that is just simply the quality of the stock. 
if you take a molded plastic stock, I mean, you've got a complete barreled action that probably takes up the bulk of the cost of that rifle. I would imagine the stock's probably the smallest investment that they're going to make. And, and like everything else, it's dollars and cents. It's trying to pass off, you know, the best value to the customer. So if they can make a molded injection stock for $35 or for whatever it costs, um, it helps keep the cost of the rifle down, which helps reduce the cost of the rifle to you. But that comes with a lot of problems as well. Um, we see it at the shooting school here where you have somebody shooting prone with a bipod in the front. And if you can picture, I'll reach down and grab the, the top rear of the rifle at the buttstock. And I'll hold the bipod firm. And I'll just twist the buttstock at the rear closer to the recoil pad left and right. And you can watch the front twisting and turning the barrel and the the um, forearm of the stock or forend of the stock are actually swinging back and forth opposite of each other that is not good when it comes to taking a really good shot or a long range shot or you would like to shoot tiny little groups at 100 yards having that rifle flex and bow another example was we had a, a stock come through the school here literally the customer's head on the rifle you could literally just push down on the rear of the rifle right where your head belongs, and you can watch the, the stock flex and bow up and down. So if you can imagine under recoil, all these added things it's going to put into that equation, it's just, uh, it's funny. You know, when you get into a factory gun, one of the first things I say, you know, if it's a really decent shooting gun and you like it a lot, um, is considered possibly replacing the stock with something that A, has an adjustable length of pull that you can fit to you, has an adjustable cheek piece, or at least a way that we can get our face on the gun. But uh, I don't want to go too far forward into the custom stocks yet. Let's keep talking about the factory stocks and some things that you can do to help fix some of these problems. So the length of pull, you're sort of stuck. Uh, some of the newer rifles like the Ruger Precision Rifle has an adjustable length of pull. That's actually a really nice thing on that stock. Some other things to consider when you're when you're looking at the stock itself, especially if you're shooting and starting out with a factory gun, is there's a rear stud on the bottom of the stock for a sling. I recommend that if you're really going to shoot this rifle with a rear bag uh, prone <clears throat> or even off the bench, is to take that stud out. That stud will catch and grab on the rear bag on objects that you're shooting off of, even bounce off your hand under recoil. So take that stud out, just a little side note. The additional problem that rolls into going with a factory gun is just majority of them do not have an adjustable cheek piece. And so it's really important in long range shooting that you can get a good cheek weld and cheek pressure on the rifle. So you want a really good cheek weld, a place that you're going to put your face in the gun, and then you want to have it set up to where you apply the same amount of pressure on the stock each and every single time you shoot. And then you put a, a really nice optic you know that has a bigger objective lens which means you got to get the scope off the right or uh, the the scope off the action more so you've got to use high rings so you've raised the scope up off the rifle you have no cheek piece and you're basically you know holding your head up off the stock with all of that neck muscle uh trying to shoot all the time and a that will wear you out as a shooter but b it makes for terrible precision shooting a, a way that you can adjust that, though, let's just say you have a, a factory Savage and you really like it a lot. <clears throat> it does not have an adjustable uh, cheek piece of any kind. There are some aftermarket cheek pieces that you can attach. There's one that's called Cheekies. It's like this little uh, foam thing that you stick to the stock itself. And, and some of them have like little quarter inch and half inch adjustments that, that you can put on the stock itself to at least try to get some type of cheek weld and cheek pressure. The other issues roll right down the line. Uh, they usually don't have aluminum pillars installed to keep, you know, when you tighten down your action screws from crushing the stock. That, you know, reduces a lot of re repeatability of taking the barreled action in and out of the stock and expecting it to hold and maintain zero perfectly. Although it's a great place to start out long range shooting, everyone that I know has started off with a factory rifle. The stock can be one of those areas that, that just really leaves you wanting for more. So if you get a really nice shooting rifle like a Savage, for example, and you like it a lot and it's shooting really well, a really nice upgrade for that would be putting a nice nice uh, stock on it. You know, something from McMillan with an adjustable length of pull, an adjustable cheek piece. 
It's just going to allow you to get even more out of that rifle. It's going to allow you to fit it properly better to you, get a good cheek weld, cheek pressure, and so on. So when you get into custom rifles, though, we talk a lot about chassis, and then you've got your molded stocks like your Manners and McMillan. Let's start with the chassis systems. Right out of the gate, and some of this bleeds over into the factory guns, is there is a lot of chassis systems out there that look tactical, and I spell that tactical with a C-O-O-L at the end. They look like they belong on a 16-year-old's wall on a poster. Even though they look the part, they are absolutely garbage. There are a ton of chassis out there right now. And there are several that we will not build on. So anytime a new chassis system comes out, I bring it in, I test it, I look it over, I'm checking it to see how rigid it is. Is it bowing or bending if I put pressure on the stock uh, in the rear? Is it um, is it repeatable? Is there any uh, imperfections in the channel when we when we lock the action into place? Is that area perfectly straight and true? You know, there's so many issues that come involved in it, but. I'll warn you right out of the gate, if you look on our website, you'll see a list of stocks there, and those are the list of stocks that we'll build on, and there's a reason for that. There's a lot of garbage stocks out there, so just because you buy a custom stock doesn't mean you're getting anything better than the factory, and let me go and share a story with you about this. So we built a really great shooting custom rifle for a customer of ours that lives in northeastern Pennsylvania. He's a pretty good shot. He's traveled the country shooting. He's been to our shooting school several times. He's done an event called King of the Mountain. We do in Seneca Rocks, West Virginia with us twice, maybe three times now. So we, we did another rifle for him, and this one was in the form of a barreled action. Now, I test and shoot every rifle we build here, and the rifle was a great shooter. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Really, really great shooter. Send it up to him. He had it, you know, when we talked about the chassis, he was going to put it in. He put it in the chassis that we spoke about, and the rifle was shooting great. And then out of the blue, he calls me up and says, hey, Jamie, um, I'm not really, you know, all that happy with the accuracy of this rifle. Something's going on. Something's happened. And so right away, of course, my ears perk up, and I start asking lots of questions. You know, in, in all the years we've been building rifles, we've never had one come back that didn't shoot. So usually there's an issue going on somewhere. We just have to find it. So we started talking a little bit more. And then I had asked him, I said, well, are you still using the same stock you were shooting before? And his answer was no. So I asked him which stock he was using, and he told me. And I said, oh, gosh, I know that's a pretty cool-looking stock, but my experience here is is they do not lean well towards the accuracy end of things. And uh, he laughed a little bit, and he said, hey, you know, but the stock fits me so well, and I like it a lot, and it's really light. Now, I did say the keyword light. And I said to him, I said, put it back in the original stock and shoot it and see what happens. And so, you know, we put it back in for an event we had. It went back into the original stock and it was shooting great. And then, I don't know, six months later, nine months later, we were talking. And um, he said, you know, the rifle's just not shooting as good anymore. And I started asking him some questions and he said, I put it back in that other stock. The one that you told me not to put it into, but it won't shoot in that. And he said, I just don't understand it. He said, he said, I don't understand why it won't shoot in that stock. I explained to him like I'm explaining here about, you know, there's all kinds of issues when they make them really light. They flex, they bow, they twist. They don't lock into the to the area where the action goes in straight and true. They bind um, their bow. I mean, there's just all these laundry list of things that, that are done. So I said to him, I said, you know what? I'm going to send you up the stock that I tested that, and I'm going to send you up an Accuracy International chassis system, uh, just a good old AT. Uh, and he's a, he's a really great customer. I said, I want you to put it in there and go out and shoot it, um, and then give me a call back if, if you're really not convinced that the stocks make that much of a difference. So he put it in that chassis. I got a phone call a couple of days later, and he was like, oh, my God. He said, the rifle is an absolutely tack driver. He said, I would not have believed that the stock could have made that much of a difference. And had I not put it in the different chassis testing it, he said, I don't know if I would have believed what you were saying. Needless to say, he got rid of that 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 junk stock that looked apart but absolutely did nothing for accuracy. 
and he put it back into a real stock. So so you see on our website, there's there's chassis that we say, hey, these are the chassis that we build on. They're the ones that we recommend. There are lots of other chassis out there. I'm not going to throw their names out of which ones you know I don't like or which ones I think have issues. But I think by looking on our website, you will get the idea according to the list. Some chassis that I'm a really big fan of, the good old Accurus International AT. I shot those in competitions for probably the last 15 years, 18 years. It's the old British sniper rifle style stock. Now, the newer version is a little bit narrower. Um, it's not quite as big and heavy as the old one was. But still, oh my gosh. I mean, short of running it over with your pickup truck, there's nothing you can really do to destroy these stocks. They're an integral bottom metal, so the magazine system's built right into the chassis. I mean, I, I can take them in and out a thousand times, the, the action out of the chassis, put it back in, the rifle zero never moves. It's what we've used in the shooting school for more than 10 years. We throw other stocks on the line to give some demonstrations like McMillan's. We've had A3s, A5s, A6s, so on and so forth. But the good old AT is one of my absolute favorites and probably one we build a lot of. The other thing I like a, a lot about the AT is the fact that you can change the skins from a pistol grip to a thumb hole. Now, I'm actually, I really enjoy shooting thumb hold stocks. For me, it, it gets to recoil into the palm of my hand. And I try to explain it like this, and this is just me, is when I'm shooting a, a thumb hold stock, I feel like I'm driving the car rather than being a passenger in it. I just feel like I have that much more control over the rifle. And for you magnum shooters out there, those pistol grips and thumb holes actually absorb some of the recoil into the palm of your hand which is sort of nice to, to knock that down a little bit. So I'm going to go down a list of a couple of the chassis that I like a lot and some that I have some great experience with. Right out of the gate, the J. Allen or JA700 is a fantastic stock. I have one of those on one of my personal rifles now. It is really expensive, but it is so well designed, engineered, and made. Once you get it, you'll be like, oh my gosh. So it, it fits your, your shooting real well. It's, it fits me perfectly. Just the attention to detail and how they did the grip, the buttstock, there's so many other things involved in it that it, it is one of my favorite stocks. The only the only negative to it is it is, you know, $1,900. Now, I'm not saying you have to buy a $1,900 stock to go out and enjoy what we're doing. I'm not. But I will say that, you know, if you really like that stock, stock save and get it it is it is or a stock save and make that purchase right the first time all right so chassis accuracy international at um i love that that chassis the masterpiece arms you've got some of the krg stocks you've got um the j allen which i like a lot the ax chassis you'll see for accuracy international great stock and we do build a lot on them but my, my biggest issue with that particular stock is this. I really don't care for the chassis that have the tube over the barrel. And the reason being is it shrinks um, the distance from the bipod to the barrel. So you have to have a longer bipod to shoot prone. And then also because that shroud over the barrel is off the, over the top of the barrel, a lot of times you have to use extra high rings for the scope to clear which then again means you've got to take your face even more off the rifle or have a higher cheek piece. And so you, you have a lot of people that love those chassis, and I am not knocking them in any way, shape, or form. There's just a couple of reasons why I'm, I don't personally shoot them, and, and sometimes they can cause some small issues with new shooters. So those are the, the chassis systems that I really like a lot. Now, when you get into the molded stocks, of course, you've got McMillan and Manners, I really think McMillan has, has spent so much time and effort in trying to get their stocks, you know, not only a great variety of models to choose from, but just a lot of well thought out things that need to be done to get it to shoot straight. So when we order a, a McMillan, for example, for a customer, we try to insist that you get an adjustable length of pull on it. It is $125 more. <clears throat> So just having the ability to adjust that length of pull just gives you some options to try some things out. And you might be surprised, uh, like my friend Richard, who shoots a you know 14 and three quarter inch length of pull, had he not had a spacer system, he probably would have never had the chance to experience or experiment with that length of pull to see if there's a way to, to get the rifle to feel more natural to him or, or be more comfortable for him, the shooter. <clears throat> so the, the adjustable length of pull, the adjustable cheek piece, 
um, it does add some weight to rifles. So for a hunting rifle, I see why guys might not want the adjustable cheek piece and even the adjustable length of pull, trying to save all of that weight. But heavy rifles do shoot a little bit better. And so I don't mind the adjustable length of pull. And like we talked about with the factory guns, there's ways to get around the the adjustable cheek piece with some just little add-ons that you can add onto the back. If you order a McMillan stock or a Manners, we, we insist when we order them here that they have aluminum pillars that's installed at the time that they're made. And this was shared with me by Dick at McMillan years ago. He was one of their designers and engineers. He has since passed away. But, you know, years ago when we were talking on the phone, he said, he said, Jamie, he said, as long as you order our stocks with the pillars installed, 95% of the time, betting them will make no difference whatsoever as long as you're using a high-end action It's straight and true. And in 5% of the time, the betting of the action, the difference will be immeasurable. So so he sent me a stock. Um, I still have it uh, today. With pillars installed, I've taken the action, the barreled action out a thousand times. I've never betted this rifle. It shoots absolutely lights out. My zero doesn't change. All of these things that, that you hear people about betting them. So the way I see it, unless there's a problem, sometimes it, you know it's better off to leave it alone than insert another thing that could possibly cause an issue. Now, I, I say that, and I want to be careful in sharing this with you, that we're using you know bad actions, and bad actions are perfectly straight and true. If you have a Remington 700 or something like that, that has warped a little bit in the manufacturing process where the, the action can be bowed, then, of course, bedding can can definitely help that rifle a lot. So, you know, on the bedding portion, I'm talking about really high-quality custom actions. Just order the stock with the aluminum pillars installed. Uh, make sure it's inlined properly for your action. And really, a lot of times, bedding it is an absolute waste of your time and money. Then, of course, when you get into the McMillans and, and the aftermarket stocks like that, you can you can get them with heavy fills if you want to make the rifle you know heavier for competition or they call it a sniper fill. You can get it in carbon fiber. So we just got one of the McMillan A6s, and I am an absolute fan of that stock. It is the A5 done for current times. Uh, it's not as big and bulky. It's smooth. It's flat on the sides. It fits my hand really well. Uh, redesigned the grip area a little bit. It is a straight up competition stock, and I got two of them in carbon fiber, and I am absolutely blown away. A, they look awesome, but B, they're light. When you pick them up, you're like, wow, that's pretty impressive. Even with an adjustable length of pull and cheek piece, it's a big stock. It's super light. So you got some choices to go with there. A couple other side things to talk about with the custom stocks is, you know, make sure that I try to get the stocks with flush cups. So the flush cups are on the bottom or quick, uh, quick disconnect sling studs that you leave your, your sling attached to these studs. They just snap in and out. Um, so when you're shooting prone, if I want to take a long range shot and I have a sling on my gun, which normally I don't, I just usually put a sling on there for shooting is I can reach up and push a button on the bottom of the stock and remove the sling and the stud at the same time. So I have a nice, nice smooth area underneath the rear of, of my stock for the bag to slide freely back and forth. I don't have that bump like you would see with a traditional stud. So hopefully that helps you out a little bit with the, with the stocks, but I want to continue on to talk about the triggers a little bit. When you get into long range shooting or precision shooting, whatever you want to call it, you know, you get into the trigger issues with pull weight, and then you've got the whole trigger issue of uh, some people like a two stage trigger, some people like a single stage trigger, and, and then you've got the different brands. So when you're selecting a trigger, there's a lot of factory guns that have great triggers in them already. The Acura trigger was a fantastic design by, by Savage with that. A little um, safety built right into the trigger that, you know, you can't just bump it and it go off. If you have a factory gun and the trigger's adjustable and it gets down to a suitable weight that you like, uh, just shoot it for a while until you replace it or decide that it's time. The aftermarket triggers, though, there are some that are more tolerable to dirt and debris in the field than others. So just pay attention. Um, I know you'll hear people talk about this online and on forums. This is a real problem. A good friend of mine shot a really high name brand trigger 
in sniper matches for years, and he carried a can of lighter fluid around with him, a little little uh, vial of it that he could flush his trigger out um, because it has failed or locked up in the field on him before. It happens. The couple triggers that we recommend here, um, I like the good old rifle basics. I think it's a great design trigger and super tolerable for dirt and debris in the field. Then you get into trigger tech. They make uh, several different lines that are, uh, start off at about 150 bucks that um, really break super nice and have an adjustable weight that you can adjust there. And then you get into something like the Huber, you know, where you now into like $250, $300. They make a, a single stage and two stage trigger. So there's there's a wide variety of price ranges that you can get these in. The one thing I can warn you, though, is when you're making your selection, you know, just pay attention as to which ones are going to be a lot more fuel tolerable than others, especially if you plan on doing like PRS type shooting or sniper type matches. Now, trigger pull weight always comes up into this subject, and I'm going to cover it here. I built a rifle for a good friend of mine who's in his late 60s. He's been around shooting forever. And when I built him his rifle, I had asked him, you know, hey, what do you want your trigger pull weight set at here? And his answer shocked the living daylights out of me. His answer was three and a half pounds. And I was like, oh, my gosh, three and a half pounds. He goes, oh, Jamie, you don't understand. He said, all my guns are set to three and a half pounds. It just feels like the same trigger that I shoot all the time. And so he brought up a really good point is it's not really so much about the pull weight as it is you getting used to being able to shoot that pull weight properly. And he is a great shot. He's a good example that you you can run a heavier weighted um, pull and and shoot just fine if you if you can get used to running that trigger. So when you get into pull weight, I, I'm always a little cautious on this one. When you get into pull weight on rifles, I think a pound and a half and two pounds is perfect for most of the tactical type matches. I mean, my my personal triggers are in that area. I'm a big fan of two stage triggers because you have to take up that first stage before you hit the back wall and break the actual trigger. So I do like two stage triggers as well. But I'm going to warn you on this one, whether it's a two stage trigger or a single stage trigger. The bench rest triggers are bleeding their way over into field competitions like PRS type shooting or tactical and sniper matches. And from my personal perspective, safety is always first. You know, I don't see any place for a four ounce trigger on a firing line, especially one where you're moving around and transitioning barricades. And the reason I say that is not that people aren't smart enough to keep the bolt up, you know, to make sure that their chamber's empty. But when you make that mistake and you accidentally have a round in that chamber and you're running and you slip and fall and that gun goes off um, and you shoot somebody, A, you've, you've, you've harmed another human being, possibly killed them. You're going to live with that for the rest of your life. At a sniper match not too long ago and a guy had an accidental discharge and he got DQ'd from the match and the guy shrugged it off like it was no big deal. It's like, ah, oh, it happens. It's way more important than that. If you shoot long enough, there's that chance you're going to have an accidental discharge. And what an accidental discharge is means that you've closed the bolt or you have a live round in the chamber and you've touched the trigger before you were ready for the gun to go off and the gun went off. And the bullet went somewhere else it wasn't supposed to go. So I was at a match one time and a guy with a 300 wind mag, we were supposed to take this offhand shot. He closed the bolt, wrenched in, and grabbed a hold of the grip and the gun went off at a 45-degree angle. Now, he was shooting a 208-grain AMAX out of a 300 wind mag, that bullet came down somewhere. Imagine at a match or an event, imagine actually accidentally shooting somebody. So give yourself a break. You don't get any extra points because your rifle doesn't move off a barricade or you, the rifle's not moving because you have two ounces of trigger pull rather than a, um, a pound or pound and a half, two pound trigger. You know, now it just stays perfectly stunned. Just touch the trigger. Well, this this isn't bench rest. And the, a lot of that stuff is bleeding over into here. And that might get you, you know, in your mind, you might get that one extra point to take first place. Uh, but it also might cost you way more than that. So when it comes to trigger pull weight, I always lean on the side of caution. This is the other issue with two-stage triggers too. One of the reasons I like Hoover is because they split it. So the first stage is one pound, second stage is one pound, making a two-pound trigger. 
the two stage, you can't fire the gun until you get to the second wall. So you've got that first pull and then you hit this wall and then you break it. I'm not saying that this makes the trigger idiot proof. If you reach in and grab the trigger and pull it back, the gun's going to go off. But if you bump the trigger by accident, the gun's not going to fire. The reason I like the Hoobers over some of the other two-stage triggers out there is they split the weight in half. Some of the two-stage triggers have you know a pound and a half or pound first stage and a four-ounce second stage. So when you're shooting quickly at a, at a game animal or, or in a competition where the clock is running and you pull that trigger back to get through that first stage to hit that wall and you blow right through the wall and the gun goes off. I'm really careful on the two-stage triggers even to make sure that I can pull back to hit a nice wall that I can break and I can feel, not something as I'm pulling back that is so light when I get to that wall the gun fires. Without going overboard when talking about safety, it's just one of those things that, you know, we always want everybody to go home in the same condition that they arrived in when they come to a match or when they come to the school or when you go with your friends to an event or you go and shoot prairie dogs. So I don't think having a three ounce trigger in a rifle that we're using in the field lends to, to be on the side of caution just a little bit. Why not give yourself a little bit of a break on that one and a chance? So pound and a half to two pounds perfect, you know, two, two and a half. Um, my good friend has been doing this forever. He shoots one that's three and a half. The weight's not as critical as just a really good, crisp, clean break of the trigger. So you'll hear people describe it as, you know, like breaking glass. So the Hoover has a nice break. Trigger Tech has a super break. I mean, that's that roller pin that they designed in their triggers. Really super clean break on the trigger. Just pay attention to, A, which brand you're purchasing. And think about the pull weight a little bit on this one. You know, don't think that it's the fastest car that wins the race every time or the person with the least amount of trigger pull that they can get by with. It doesn't really buy you any extra points. And in, and in some cases could really cost you dearly if you have an accident or an accidental discharge at a range. Uh, it would definitely embarrass the daylights out of you and may end up just costing you something way more than that if it turns into a serious accident. So just keep that in mind when you're out there and having at it. And so we talked about some of the different brands. We talked about the pull weight. But the other thing that, that we don't talk about a lot is the shoe design. And here's where I think a lot of guys or girls pick out they, the trigger that they actually really like a lot. And so when you get a chance to try several different types of triggers or a couple of different types of triggers, sometimes you'll just like the way that design of the shoe is. It fits your finger really well. Some are curved, some are flat, some are round. But a lot of times it's the shoe design that you really just grow to be fond of, just how it fits you and how, it's, how it sets in there. So, for example, uh, Jewel makes a great trigger. I don't shoot them personally because I really don't like shooting those super small, thin triggers. They, they doesn't give me that flat reference point on the front of the trigger itself to make sure that I'm pulling it square to the rear. So I actually use the face of the trigger to try to dictate where my finger is at to make sure it's perfectly square across the face that I'm pulling straight to the rear. And when you get a round trigger or a really narrow trigger, in my mind, I can't find that spot as easy. So I like a little bit wider trigger shoes. So the um, the Hoover is probably my favorite and probably more than anything, it's probably the trigger shoe. So when you get out there and you try different triggers – Pay attention to how it feels, not just as far as the brake and everything goes, but pay attention to the trigger shoe. Uh, you might find that just changing that out really helps you a lot on getting that perfect feel for where your finger is supposed to be and breaking a really great shot. The Bix and Andy is, is one that sort of neat that you can change the trigger shoe out. They have a couple of different options. So if you have a narrower trigger shoe, you can change it to a wider one. That's actually pretty cool. Makes for a useful trigger. But Keep in mind the trigger design and the trigger shoe when you go out and you try these. You might just accidentally bump into a trigger that you fall in love with. Not because it's the greatest breaking trigger on the planet, but the shoe fits you really, really well. 
Now, as always, you know, these are just things to try to prep you up to come to the shooting school. If you're, you know, getting your, your factory rifle up and running on the line and you're trying to get things uh, up to speed, if you're getting ready to build a custom rifle, these are just things we want you to take into consideration when you're looking at the stocks and when you're looking at the triggers and really just try to help you make the right purchase the first time uh, rather than going through the process of buying and selling and replacing items as you keep going. The last thing on the triggers I want to touch base on before we close this out with a couple of things is if you're not a competent gunsmith and you really aren't sure what you're doing playing with those triggers, make sure that you send it out to somebody who is. You really can get yourself in harm's way uh, by in there monkeying around with a trigger and not having it set properly. You can have an accidental discharge where the gun just fires by closing the bolt. So do your due diligence. If you know that you're not an expert or you're not comfortable in it, please send it to somebody who is and have them do it for you. So as always, you know, we really appreciate you coming here and listening. Um, we appreciated the feedback. We got lots of phone calls from our first couple episodes. And we'd like to ask that if you have any episodes that you'd like us to speak about here or some upcoming interviews that we're getting ready to do, please email us. Our email is contact at wolfprecision.net. Please check us out on Facebook. And of course, our website's wolfprecision.net. You can get on there and see all the cool stuff and events that we'll be at, any shows and events we'll be doing. So again, thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the show. I am your host, Jamie Dotson, and you are listening to the Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast. Mm-hmm.